The Beats. De Amerikaanse literatuur uit de 50 en 60 jaren. U kent ze wel. On the Road. Gesprek met de familie Cassidy. This is the wife of Neil Cassidy, who, of course, we all know Jack Kerouac um, used as a model in On the Road. And we have next to her uh, John Cassidy, his son. And uh, to my left here, we have Brian Hassett, who is a companion and uh, perhaps biographer. Yeah. He's my and, son, too. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and. John is also Carolyn's son. There could be some confusion son. there. <laughs> and we know that for sure because Carolyn claims him, you know. It's a, it's, a, it's a mythology that we've carried a long way here, we men, that uh, in fact we always want him named after us, but in fact the women are the ones that really know. Okay, so we'll move on from that aside. Uh, Carolyn, maybe I could ask you first off, uh, how did you meet Neil? And uh, what was a little of that... Uh, initial meeting? Well, it was kind of a longish story. It's the first chapter in my book, incidentally, called Off the Road. Anyway, uh, I was a graduate student at the University of Denver, and there was a r rich young man who was um, didn't know what to do with himself, and he used to hang around the the campus and took a liking to me, and he would tell me about this wonderful friend of his who um, had so many adventures and, and so much brilliance and on and on, and that he was a student at Columbia University with one Jack Kerouac and Allen Ginsberg, who were writers and poets and eminent and So uh, um, I lived in a residence hotel in Denver. I was uh, um, getting my master's in fine arts and theater arts, and I was building a set for a model theater that day. It was Saturday morning. I'm on the floor, all scoofy and everything, um, putting little glass beads on wires for a spider web. Anyway, uh, Bill Thompson was the guy's name, and he called from the lobby and said, could I come up for a minute? And I said, oh, I'm really busy. I don't know. Well, all right. So when I opened the door here, two of them, and the other one was the famous Neil Cassidy. So, of course, I was terribly embarrassed and overwhelmed. And um, Bill had told uh, Neil, see, I've never known anybody to lie or why you'd lie. or uh, And so these guys were masters at it, and I just, of course, ate up everything. They said I believed them. And uh, he told Neil, in order to lure him up to my room, that I had this great collection of Lester Young records. So Neil comes in, he's got on a charcoal pinstripe suit and a white t-shirt and looks very Damon Runyon-ish, you see. And uh, he said, Bill tells me you have this large collection of uh, Lester Young records. And I said, uh, uh, Lester who? And <laughs> <laughs> so that was, you know, I'm glaring at Bill every little while here. But anyway, so Neil sat down, perfectly relaxed, and went through my albums. And they're all like Duke Ellington, Stan Kenton, uh, Benny Goodman, you know. And he said, oh, fine, could I play something? Because they all liked those guys, too. So uh, he put on a record and then, um, and just absolutely quiet, but just looked at me. <laughs> so he had eyes like lasers, and um, that was the start. We spent the rest of the day and the afternoon and, and so on with him. Oh, well, it's a longer story, but that's how I met him. <laughs> read the book. <laughs> well, yeah, we'll uh, Sorry, like certainly you. recommend that book uh, <laughs> as we go along here. There's better bookstores everywhere near you. I'm mm -hmm. sure the American uh, book center Except, down the no, way. No, they just yeah. sold out. <laughs> just sold out, but yep. they'll have more in soon. Well, they hope don't. so. I hope so. They don't have any in London. So from this first meeting, you uh, you went on seeing Neil uh, straight away? Or? Oh, yes. He was constant. Uh, you know, of course, I didn't know what else was going on because uh, a couple of weeks later, Allen Ginsberg came to town because Allen had, had uh, been, you know, following him. And he had no place to stay, so he actually stayed in, in my hotel room, which was very dangerous for a couple of weeks until he got his, his own place. And of course, I had no idea of the relationship or Alan's problem at the time. Um, 
Yeah, it was funny because when Neil first brought him up and introduced him, they had to go out and, and, and some reasonable excuse for a few minutes. Of course, it was to go get high. So they came back with these pink eyes and... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I knew I knew, I knew, I knew. And of course, never heard of homosexuals anyway. So, uh, I mean, you really won't believe how sheltered and naive I was. So it was perfect for Neil. And I think it was a couple of years before I found out that at this time he was also seeing Luann. And, uh, well, I met her the very first night and all, and she gave him to me and I said wait I just met him you know and she said oh you're much better for him anyhow they're still seeing each other and he's doing this little um, I think Jack describes this too of uh, uh, an hour with me then Luann then to Alan then he had to get up and, and drive this jitney you know for shoppers and then you know this was his routine endless energy but I didn't know any of this was happening it was just that he was he knew exactly how to where every single person was coming from. He really was a genius in this way. He could psych you out instantly, so he knew exactly how to treat me. He was a perfect gentleman. He was nothing but um, literary, philosophical, you know, very, very uh, dignified and sincere, and I bought it all, and um, um, don't regret that. <laughs> but so he, you know, did the campaign. And so at some on. point he made you his wife? Well, first of all, we lived together a while in Denver, and then um, he had promised Alan that he would go to Texas with him to Bill Burroughs and try to be gay, or at least enjoy it. He really would try. And I had, my year uh, had ended at the university, and I had uh, arranged for interviews in Hollywood. I wanted to be a Hollywood costume designer so I could travel. And I had interviews there, so I went to Hollywood, some English friends drove me there, and he went to Texas with Alan. But the very morning that I left, I had spent the night with another professor, because I didn't want them to know I was living with him, but I went back to our room in order to um, say one more goodbye, and in the bed were Alan, Neil, and Nguyen in that order. So this was some so some exciting thing, days. There. Something Denver, of a shock. Right there, huh? Yes. Just like Jack said. Yeah. So of course I thought that's it, you know, that's the end, forget it. Da, da, da. So off I went to California thinking I'd never see him again. But, you know, he kept writing letters and so forth and so then I went to San Francisco to wait for the job opening and um, two months later he came out there with me and um, eventually we got married when Luann decided all right she'd get the annulment <laughs> after she had come to San Francisco. Anyway, so it's all in the book. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well we'll try to paraphrase a little of it here. So, uh, yeah, so there you are in San Francisco with Neil Cassidy and probably uh, Jack Kerouac came out by that time. Oh, he'd come to Denver. Sorry, Jack had come. Alan came in March or April and Jack came in July. So I met Kerouac <coughs> that same, um, it's 1947 we're talking. And, uh, but he was staying with his richer friends who didn't like Neil. And every now and then he could get away, but I, I can't quite remember how this happened, that I was uh, being in a play in, the, uh, in Denver University, and Jack came and watched rehearsals. I wouldn't let Neil, because I, I didn't want to act, and I was awful. For some reason, Jack did, and, and um, then we'd ride back and forth on the trolley together, and, uh, um, and then Neil and I and Jack went out to... Uh, um, we used to call roadhouses in America, and Jack and I danced, and uh, <clears throat> he said, too bad, Neil saw you first. Well, that was that. You know, in those days, we had this sense of honor, and um, I was married, that was it. You know, there was no question. So, um, but that was sort of beginning. Then he went, he left, and uh, um, I can't remember when I saw him again, but that was the beginning. Well, sometimes... I we have this vision, uh, I suppose, 
often instilled in, in us because everybody read On the Road and somehow has it as part of the iconography of America in some way. Um, and you always think of uh, the principal character, Dean Mor Moriarty, as, as uh, Neil Cassidy, of course, yeah, well, then always I being wild. And who, yeah, which well, character were you here? Well, Camille in On the Road, but you see, he camouflaged me. You know, I had black hair and black lace, ha ha ha. And uh, because it just wasn't done, you didn't write about having an affair with your best friend's wife, especially if there were children that were going to grow up and read books. So you see, there's all this sense of honor that they were much more conventional than people realize. And so, you know, in, in, on the road, uh, I, I just cry all the time, which I, I did at the time, actually. <laughs> you're a liar, you're a liar. Yeah, that, that's pretty accurate. But then in later books, he calls me Evelyn and uh, gets more. Jack Kerouac's books, you were not exactly who you were, or well, was this an on, emulation really of the lifestyle you were leading I, in this group? Well, as far as on the road, yes, that he was, because every time they came back, I'd throw them out, kind of, you know, so <laughs> it didn't, wasn't working too well. But because I hung in there, um, I learned an awful lot, and things got a lot better as years went on, and Jack lived with us up and on, and... Um, Big Sir is where he confesses. He's gotten over the honor a bit. <laughs> Tells about my two husbands. But, um, so at some point in this long uh, relationship, you had a, a son here, huh? Mm, three kids all together. You have three, oh, three yeah, children. Oh, yeah, two girls and a son. Okay. This is no. my baby. <laughs> so you had the baby, baby John over here. I uh, had uh, two daughters first and then... Kathy was born in uh, September of 48. Yeah. Jamie and um, January. Jamie is the next uh, daughter down. They were 18 months apart. Yeah, January so of 50. And I was September of 51. So yeah, it spaced them out. And you months. told me once that, um, you know, for the 10 minutes you guys were getting along well when he was home. <laughs> <laughs> Bam. <laughs> no, no, it, huh? no, the last two were immaculately conceived. Oh, sorry, is that but they were, yes. So am I the mailman? No, no. Yeah. Nope. Okay. Some immaculate conception going on here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Not only was it mythology, but it was well, immaculate. you must have gotten along for a few minutes. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> no. Nope. <laughs> there was yeah, right. no way. <laughs> well, so I was the run of the family and the baby growing up, and so spoiled rotten, of course. And still he am. our little angel. Yeah, right. But uh, <laughs> ever has been. <laughs> sure. Was Neil around at all? Or? Well, that's the most uh, frequently asked question. I think is is did you know your dad or mm -hmm. did you meet your dad? And it's and it's not <laughs> it's not a bad question because I realized um, after years of reading and meeting his, his old friends and stuff that the man was everywhere at once. In other words. It's not an invalid question to ask if he was around during our childhood because, my God, he was also here, there, and everywhere else at the same time. And half of it's the myth and everything like that, but a lot of it's documented. I mean, how could he be in L.A. and Berkeley and Oakland? And wait a second, I have to intervene here, which is another part of the myth, was that he was all over the place. You have to remember that for ten solid years he worked on the railroad and never missed a call. Yeah. And he always had a job and he supported his family, but for ten solid years he was at home, or at least well, those on the weekend. <laughs> yeah, right. And I thought he was there all the time, you know, looking back. I mean, you forget a lot of stuff when you're a little kid, but I thought I had an idyllic childhood. And nobody can believe it reading this stuff where all his adventures. So what I was going to say was, yeah, for those ten years where, where you're, you're zero to ten, you know, I thought he was around all the time, and it was great, and I have a zillion memories, which of course I'll write someday uh, <laughs> and put down in my memoirs at better bookstores near you. But uh, until then, it's like uh, there were so many memories of just growing up as a little kid where he was just so funny and, uh, and always there, you know, and he, he might not have been the best disciplinarian, and poor mom had to, you know, do the spanking or whatever. He wouldn't even say no, a, a bad even. word. Uh -huh. Because, you know, it's the probably little guilt thing about the absent parents sometimes. I mean, he wasn't, I guess he was off on the railroad, but when I was a kid climbing trees or playing softball or whatever, you don't miss him. It's just like I thought he was around all the time. Mm -hmm. In fact, in the 60s, we couldn't get rid of him. <laughs> eat all the salad. As soon as I divorced him, he was there more than he had, ever had been. So yeah, I, I knew him quite well, and, and especially in the early days, it was just great. A lot of, you know, funny little stories that are too long to go into now, yeah. but um, he was a great dad, I thought. Yeah, he was. Well, we never really have that 
picture. I mean, it's interesting to, to, to get a little of that. Um, let me ask you something about, you lived in California then, uh, Big Sur or Well, we lived in San, San Francisco? Francisco for five years, and then as the kids started going, I didn't know how to bring up kids in the city, and being a country girl myself, and um, so we moved to, um, uh, I wanted to, okay, we moved to as close to his railroad thing, his railroad run was from San Francisco to San Jose and so we first got a house in San Jose at the bottom of his run and then we got a house um, about 10 miles away from there he said that's okay I can I can still make it um, so that's why we moved out of San Francisco but then we lived in um, San Jose for like a year and a half and then bought this house in a posh part of the country and um, Los Gatos was it uh, wasn't as posh then it is now but it's Silicon Valley well we had to incorporate now. there was a little town here and a little town here and and the commerce was you know so we incorporated this natural beauty area as a city so it no commercial things could be in there so we happened to get a house that had already been built before this was done and it was on only a, a third of an acre now you can't do anything less than an acre but um, it was called Monte Sereno because it would fit in the mountains. Somehow so. I, I'm still having a hard time having a vision of Neil Cassidy in suburban land. Listen, this <laughs> is the biggest misunderstanding there is. <laughs> One of Neil's major drives, which I think I only realized a couple of years ago, was to be respectable. Now, nobody's going to buy this, but it's absolutely true. Me, for instance, that was the attraction of why he went so hard for me and why he kept coming back because I represented, you know, upper middle class and so on. And then uh, he became a, a homeowner and the head of a family. This was one of the pillars of his self-respect. The railroad job was the other. So just to skip ahead, when you see him with Kesey, he had lost all of that. And he had given up entirely any more hope of, because uh, he was passionate about improving himself and the spiritual stuff and everything and he knew he had lost everything and so he just wanted to get killed and he just was babbling trained bear. I mean movies you see in the source of him it's just masochistic sadistic stuff I've got the name I'll play the game but you know he was quite a provider in the 50s before you know well, of course, trouble started 10 years on the railroad he right. always just gave me his paycheck well and, and you know i think it started the the pot bust and all that really took the wind out of his sails and he lost well, all and that well and that was came a, that was a false accusation the whole corrupt justice system the welfare system was corrupt that his family had to live on and um so, and then the railroad wouldn't take him back. I mean, they hired criminals. He used to bring home second story men that would go around and check all my locks and things, you know. And I'd say, what's the guy doing? He's saying he's a second story man, you know. And so the railroad didn't have anything against, you know, cons. But because a newspaper reporter had gotten ahead of, of the real thing and took the DA's theory, they published in the San Jose paper that Neil was head of a import gang for marijuana that imported marijuana from Mexico on Southern Pacific trains. We never even got to LA, much less in Mexico. He's a drug but because leader. that was printed in the paper, even though they retracted it, the railroad said, sorry, it was in the paper. And they wouldn't talk to him again. Their very best employee they'd ever had. So this was such a terrible blow. Must have been devastating for him, right? Well, that's I mean, it. That injustice. He built all this up from kind of scratch, and yeah, and he had all yeah, his self-respect, yeah. and, and and so Three then I, kids. thinking that, because he he took this job where he'd just come home, absolutely destroyed every day. Some nice guy in Los Gatos gave him a job, because you know when you're a felon, you're nobody. You can't, right. you know, and all that brilliant mind. He couldn't be a teacher. He couldn't, you know, forget it. You're nobody. So this nice guy in Los Gatos gave him a job recapping tires, but he would work himself to death so like flagellation, you know, and he'd come home and I'd say, I can't stand this. You don't have to do this to support this family. I can manage it. And I'd go out and do what you like and everything. Well, that was the wrong thing. Wrong thing to say, huh? That was the second pillar out from under him. Of course, it took him like two months to get out of the house. I had to keep saying, you know, we're, we're supposed to be divorced, you know, mm -hmm. but then he'd, he'd be back there more than... <laughs> 
Because, you know, I said, I don't want to do this. And, and the terms of his parole dictated how long he had to be at the tire shop, though. But yeah. it was down to the very minute he had it calculated out to the hour and the seconds that satisfy the parole board. Well, he did cheat, you know. He wasn't supposed to go out of the county, but well, he did yeah. go to San Francisco now and then. But um, anyway, I mean, it was just just uh, injustice and, and you know, all the way down. And so by the time he... He left and joined Kesey. He was taking anything, any pill, any anything he'd give me. You know, he said, I'll, I'll, I don't care, anything. And then when I heard he was rolling buses and turning Volkswagens end over end, <laughs> because his driving was always absolutely perfect. Yeah, Ken Babs told me he'd never seen anyone that could drive like him. Well, it's the thing that his perception was so much more fine-tuned than the rest of us. He never scratched the paint, never dent a fender. But he got so close to things. <laughs> the rest of us don't have that. Oh, he's looking in the back seat, mind you. Yeah, right. Ginsburg's <laughs> on the floor. Don't believe what he writes. Oh, it was wonderful. Have Neil's driving. No, he's on the floor, and <laughs> so it was frightening. But he never, ever, you know. So he was uh, just a brilliant driver. But um, what did I start this with? Um, we were talking about how good a provider he was in the 50s, and then oh, it yeah. really when took he got the wind out. So. and he's rolling buses and, and, uh, and micro back. buses. It wasn't big buses. Oh, yeah, yeah, but Thank he took you. to being the main driver. Well, for I have yeah. I have a friend who who was actually uh, volunteered to let Neil show him how you roll a Volkswagen bus end over end, <laughs> and the guy came back and cried. Everything shattered. Neil's still talking. And and the Volkswagen is a little hunk of tin <laughs> foil, but he's still going down and going back to the you know, because he did all his speed. He would never shut up, but um, he didn't do that at all, you know. When and before, but when he was trying to get out of it, Kesey doesn't believe this and doesn't think there was any death wish because. Neil was so brilliant and so alive. Well, they'd think says. he was telepathic when he'd pass on a blind turn. Or in yeah. that famous film of Ken's in the 64 trip, 16 millimeter film, where he actually got up. I was watching this at, in, at Cheesy's place just last night. Yeah, time. boy, I wish they would have got that in focus more often. Right. Right. <laughs> right. God. But he gets up and he's walking right. up and down the aisle like he's taking tickets on the old SP. And, and I Nobody asked Ken, I said, well, who's driving? <laughs> and he goes, no one. And this is 50 miles an hour down the interstate. He's walking around talking. Ken doesn't people. think he had a death wish, you know. Uh, I've seen that. Well, see, they thought he was... Uh, a, a of kind of God, I in know. a way, and yes. certainly the God of transport. And they said, though, too, that he could give you the serial number on a dollar bill. And all. I mean, but, well, this was a biographer that wrote a biography of me, and he got just really brought into these guys. He listened to me all the way along, but when he got with the pranksters, he just got sucked into it. And I said, well, look, you know, that's fine, but maybe you should say that... Um, Everybody else was totally stoned, and so maybe their, uh, you know, Perception. judgment of this thing was deep it tilted, you know, <laughs> but he wouldn't. So in that book, um, Holy Goof, uh, they're saying that Neil was so psychic he could, he could tell you the name, the serial number on a dollar bill. I don't think so. <laughs> well, his, you should know. <coughs> his, was uh, very, very brilliant. That's for sure. I think he had this brilliant sense of observation from everything I've read, and uh, I met him only once briefly, so I can't really say from personal experience, but I am friends with uh, Kesey and Babs and uh, the group of pranksters that we uh, sort of... And, and there's this whole mythology that uh, has grown up around Neil. Well, unfortunately, Cam took all those movies and all that stuff, See, we don't have the document of him when he was in his prime in his earlier days. All we have is this crazy trained bear going around and this is what people too often think he was, you know, and they think it's all wonderful and we just want to And that's know, always cast in brass for history whereas if he was as well documented in 47 as he was in 67 oh, we'd might. really know the real, why well, these guys changed the course of history. Yeah, that's right, because, you know, who believe no it from any of the mm. movies or plays? You don't know why they're attracted to each other, much less, you know, how they could There's no evidence in the later stuff. Else. In the later stuff, he's just this clown. It's, you know, stupid clown. Oh, he's I think he was always brilliant. Still a brilliant clown. Well, <laughs> yeah, he's a brilliant clown. <laughs> well, all the stuff that he had too. backed up in his intellect, I mean, because he could, he could relate to three or four subjects at the same time, which is everybody says. I can remember, you know, when I wanted to say something to him, he's watching television, he's reading the newspaper, and I'm trying to tell him something. And I said, you know, Neil, would you give me your attention? He said, I heard every word you said. 
And he would tell me every word I said. He also knew everything the television said and everything was reading the paper. You know, it's he was awesome with that brain. Unfortunately, it got wasted. But um, well, let me ask you something. We as we uh, to back up a little bit, you know, we're talking about the forties and the fifties. We moved up to the Kesey era. And, oh yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, I switched. But, but. Um, I'm wondering. So, what was your position when On the Road came out? Wasn't that 1956? 57. 57. Yeah, published. I mean, he but you know, was circulating it, in it around uh, in, in 56, uh, kind of a, a, a pre-publication uh, piece, I think, as I recall. But anyway, in 47 or 57 when it came out. Were you still with Neil at that time? Oh, yeah. Um, and how did that affect his life at that point? What, the book? Yeah, the book itself. Um, well, of course, Jack had been writing it in our attic. Yeah, and forever. It was, it was first it. called Visions of Neil, and then um, it got all broken up as far as I thought. But part of it became On the Road, part of it became Visions of Cody. But uh, So he was, he was writing it long, and it took... He wrote a lot of other stuff during this time, but in '57, On the Road finally got published. And um, now, the only thing I kn know, we didn't actually discuss it, but when Jack got the advanced copies, he was in Berkeley, and Neil and Al Hinkle and Luann came over to see him, and he tossed Neil an advanced copy. Uh, so we don't have it signed. We didn't know make any difference. I have the Neil always tore the dust jackets off everything right at the uh, <laughs> start. <laughs> so all these first editions have no dust jackets and mm. hardly any signed because <laughs> we didn't know. Now you don't have your best friend sign your book. He just gives it to you. I know. I mean, and who knew that was sure. going to build into this thing? But any case, the the uh, thing that turned out later because Neil wouldn't he never criticized anybody and the last person he'd ever criticize her down would be Jack and he never ever said anything about what he thought about his betrayal until he wrote me a letter from prison and said his friend had been trying to get on the road from the library and it was always out and he said I wish nobody would read it actually because this was celebrating the part of him that he was trying to overcome, you know, the big sex thing and con man. And, and they keep calling him Jail Kid. Everybody calls him Jail Kid. The entire time he spent in reform school was less than a year. And yet, you know, everybody, you know, we read any little things. Well, in a mythology, you have to create this what, things bigger than life, yeah, don't Yeah, this you? is what Kerouac called him. Also he just didn't that, get caught that off. Also that Western twang from... from New Englander, I suppose, the way he talked, but he was so careful about his diction and this and that and that. And I hear portrayals of him, you know, where he says, Cowboy thing with a sweet and you know, he's like, <laughs> And this was not Neil. No. no. But there's audio tapes of him, and you can tell that, you know, it's not him. Well, yeah, these people that, that hacked him out or something, and they all take it. Yeah, Kizzy's got a bunch of stuff, a uh, bunch of audio tapes. Yeah. Those are the yeah, only ones, know, okay. There's none from the 50s or the 40s. No, no, oh, yeah. I have one. I told you. I've well, yeah, all the Jack, Jack's thing. tapes that made Cody. Well, and also the you know, real, they're, real stuff. They're gone, but I have this 15 minute thing left that when they're in their prime, but and there's Neil's cats reading, singing and, reading. and Jack's reading, and they're talking, That's and classic. then Jack does this cat singing. But it's only about 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. But I send it out to anybody who wants to hear it just to let them know how. It's in the CD well. box set of Kerouac, I think. Oh dear, without yeah. permission. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> it's on, uh, it's in, it was in the um, Canadian documentary too, without mm -hmm. permission. Is it, was there any residuals from On the Road? I mean, which is, must have sold 10 oh, billion copies is, yeah. by now. Didn't huh? then, yeah. But you, no, there were then no he was <coughs> trashed, you know. That but none for her. Right? But no residuals for you? Or, no. Uh, or no, or Neil, actually. You see, uh, uh, oh yeah, people keep saying that part of the reason he was arrested was because he was this hero of On the Road. Do you think any cop had ever heard of Kerouac? No, it would, let alone read it. Well, exactly. <laughs> So, of course, Neil wasn't even uh, identified until, gosh, at least ten years later. And, you know, another funny, typical Neil thing, he, well, he got one fan letter saying, are you Dean Morardi? And I don't think he answered that. Then he got a letter from a, a girl in Germany who was a student, 
So Neil answered that one. <laughs> and the letter he got back was from her teacher. <laughs> he conned the teacher through the student. <laughs> it was one of his beautiful letters. But that's the only ones I can remember. You know? I think a few people around North Beach and stuff knew just because Jack used to hang there too. And well, they and did, but I'm talking about yeah. the general public the and booksellers and yeah. the police and yeah. stuff. No, he wasn't known really until like the last 10 years as to who he was in relation to that, which was nice because we didn't have to undergo all that, what Jack had to do. Yeah, it seemed to take a big toll on Jack. Of course. What were you going to say? But he was always a bit Kesey conservative. Knew, I think he, oh, no, no. Ke Kesey knew. And, yeah, and so but not his the cops. crowd, his literary crowd, yeah, not the yeah. cops. Mm -hmm. But Kesey, of course, we always think of him as being this wild man that uh, actually Tom Wolfe created, and he spent the rest exactly. of his life, unfortunately, <laughs> yeah. uh, having to live up to Tom Wolfe's mm -hmm. uh, electric Kool-Aid acid yeah, test instead yeah. of being Ken Kesey. Right. You know, he wrote Similar his two great novels when he was still a, a young man living uh, mm -hmm. in California. I mean, mm -hmm. by the time he went back to Oregon, he really, he hasn't really produced what what could have been, but I mean that's you a, said it, I didn't. that's a, you know, I should, <coughs> I should take that back too. I mean, no, he's I written two of the was. most, uh, yeah. and I think he loved the spotlight. wonderful novels. Um, I think he loved the spotlight and hated it at the same time, similar to Jack's problems. You know, and it's yeah. created an ongoing problem for him that he had to continue to create himself mm -hmm. yeah. in that image. Right. Well, and Jack uh, just moved to Florida and started drinking. Drinking, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so he gave up on the image after. Yeah. Yeah. No, Jack vowed. He said, "I'm going to drink myself to death." <laughs> yeah, well, he was did so a good misunderstood job of that, and, and so misinterpreted, and he was so sensitive. He he kept calling you right up until the last yeah. year, right? Yeah, I hung up on him. And he used to call at 3 a.m. I'd go, "Mom, it's for you." <laughs> Tell her I love her. It was heavy. No, he said, go get a glass of wine and talk to me. And <laughs> at two in the morning, and our phone was on a bar. I had to get out of bed, and I'm freezing. <laughs> we couldn't tell him, call in the daytime, would you mind? <laughs> so the last time I hung up, and uh, oh. he kept ringing. I didn't answer him, and that was it. Oh. It was in March. He died in uh, October. Yeah. Well, in many ways, he had... You see some of these late appearances in public, and he's pretty really sad. pretty gone. We burst into right tears when really the Buckley sad. show. When that Buckley show, he... Oh, God, except for that one <coughs> wonderful witty remark that he still has his wit when he said he was arrested for decay. Yeah. <laughs> right. That was terrific. You always wondered if it was kind of a slip or... <laughs> yeah. No, his wit In fact, was, he, yeah. he really had it still to uh, still make that one... Wit. Kind of, and um, the great thing he said to staff. me, I think it's so funny, he's, in one of these phone calls, he said, you're not much bothered by wit, are you? <laughs> I thought that was the funniest thing anybody ever said. Oh, gosh. So he still had it, that. Mm. Did you ever envision that this would come to such a... Uh, you know, I mean, it, yeah, it's gone on and on, and, and, and each new generation uh, <laughs> rediscovers Kerouac and through Kerouac rediscovers Where's Cassidy. Where's the typewriter? Where's the tape recorder? Where's the shirt I mended? Where are all the letters? You know, we, we yeah, that famous it. shirt he left with her, saying, "You mended it so well. Why don't you keep it?" No, he said, "Oh, my dear, I never came back for that shirt you mended so well. Where is it?" Mm. <laughs> Some Goodwill somewhere back. Did you ever see him again after he went into the Kesey phase? Who, Neil? No. Oh, yeah, yeah, because he ran away one time. He just tore away from the farm, went to the highway without his jacket, without his cigarettes, and hitchhiked down to Marin, where as far as he could manage, and, and knocked on the door of these friends of his. And she called me and said, Neil's here. He's very sick. I said, I'll be right there. So I called Al Hinkle, who had the car, and he drove me up there, and we um, brought him home. And well, I won't go into all the details in the book. And uh, <laughs> so I said, but you know, why do you do it? Why don't you stop it? And he said, oh, I don't know. They just all look at me and expect me to perform, and I just can't help it. So when did you write this book that we've been alluding to? Well, uh, Doubleday asked me to re write it right after Jack died in 69, because everything in the media had nothing to do with it. The senior editor at Doubleday, which somebody mentioned you, was it? Uh, Doubleday did something else. Anyway, it was Loser Nichols, who was a senior editor in San Francisco, and he had had a talk show on PBS and interviewed Jack and Alan and all. So he was knew about him and really interested. And so all the stuff we're reading in the media about who Kerouac is was just like, who's that? 
So he asked me if I would write mm. my remembrances of them. So the contract was in 1970, mm. and I wrote 1,143 pages. <laughs> and, uh, Industriously. And no, I so said I had to relive the whole thing. I said yeah. I've been trying to forget this for 25 years, and <laughs> now I had to go back and try mm. and relive it and, and so forth. But Stella, Jack had died, and Stella, uh, obviously, and wouldn't give us um, permission to publish the excerpts from his letters. You can't paraphrase his letters. Mm -hmm. So we just shelved it. And then there was a whole mix-up in the publishing company, and they closed all the AA offices, and uh, they took on <coughs> something else so that we couldn't do it without permission. So that was 1970, uh, well, two, I think, when I finished it. And so there it sat. I kept trying to cut it down, but I just didn't feel like I could edit it properly and be that objective. You know, every word was, you know, to me, but to, to do it properly, I couldn't do. There were other editors that were interested in other companies, <coughs> but by then there was never again any one-to-one -one with a new unknown writer and a senior editor. You had to, to uh, send a complete copy and a big proposal and all that stuff, which I couldn't do. and. <clears throat> so 20 years later, I get a letter from a small publisher in London saying, I understand you're going to write your memoirs. <laughs> I said, no, I did that 20 years ago. And I said, but you can't publish them because we can't get permission to publish his letters. And he said, I haven't any money, so sue me. <laughs> so he and I edited it down to 400 and some pages, and he published it in 1990 in uh, London, and then it was picked up in America, and um, now Penguin has it in paperback. Oh, and great. And Stella never well, it was in another paperback, a much better one, Harper <coughs> Collins. My editor died, and so they let, let it drop, and then Penguin picked it up. So Did you get sued by Stella, or what, what oh, became of Oh, she died for it. Oh, sorry. <laughs> That's all right. Uh, she died uh, um, during the negotiation. Sampus has been, John, has still been resenting the fact that I didn't get permission for those letters. And finally, just, you know, a couple months ago, as a serling lord, I uh, explained that nobody knew, heard of John Sampus at that time. We were negotiating. Stella died during the negotiations, and actually, serling lord gave us a letter of permission. She'd totally forgotten. <laughs> so I was so happy I still had it and I could mm. send it to him. Mm. So now John Sampas is, well, he and I have always gotten along all right. It's just that he's, he is uh, protecting the rights as he should. And there's a bunch of letters, books. I'm trying to, oh, this, I'm skipping. I'm trying to do a book of Neil's collection of letters, but we'd like to use some of Jack's. And, um, John, there's other letters books coming out at the same time, but now the double editor, I mean the Viking editor, is saying that of course it'll take another year or so, so maybe we can get it going. But the Off the Road was just from this English, really small press. Well, terrific, and uh, so it's been in print. For it's been in print for years. a long time. That's a good sign, always. Yes, hardly anybody and you're a it. biography? Uh, uh, no, I'm a, I'm a scholar and a show producer and a performer and a poet and short story writer and work at MTV and do all sorts of stuff. He's wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> and our guide around uh, Amsterdam oh, this week, mm. very uh, mm. efficient at that. Yeah, current prankster and. Uh, Brian practice. gets things done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hey, <laughs> every entourage needs that. Yeah, well, okay. it's, it's not just uh, the entourage thing, because we, we, we've we been for performing together for the last two days. Uh, and he's speaking at the uh, Cannabis Cup down at the PAX uh, house. And John and I first met by performing together at a show I produced in New York at the Bitter End. So, you know, w there's actually sort of a collaboration going. And whenever these events come up, we all, there's sort of a whole network of beats around the world. Dave Amram is very active in it and all sorts of people that... So we all kind of like interact at different events in different ways and produce whether it's books or uh, or shows or whatever. Symposia. And, and, yeah, symposia. <laughs> the shows are more fun, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and 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 collaborate with young people in each of these different places. They were just down in Orlando a little while ago. We do it in New York on a regular basis. Here we are here doing it, collaborating with a bunch of locals on all sorts of levels and ages. 
So it's a, it's a neat ongoing process that's still affecting and changing people's lives today. And selling books. Yeah. <laughs> and selling books. She has a book, uh, by the way, that <laughs> she wrote that? about until oh, nine years ago. Did you know that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's called Off the Road. Hey, wait a minute. Neil has a book, too, called The First Third, which, which is, is his, the first third of his life while he's still able to write. And that's been in print since 1970. It's translated all over the world. And that's got the letters to Jack. Yeah, it's got no, the, it has some the, Mary, the Cherry some Mary letters are to Jack. Joan Anderson letter. Yeah, yeah. There, you know, a couple of excerpts of stuff. That mm -hmm. I would have deleted, but there they are. Still in print all those years. <laughs> yeah, and translated. It popular. was translated into Dutch, but I, don't, I gather it still isn't. They're translated. very good at translating books. Uh, small population, and uh, they're quite literate. But today. I don't know if it still is. The Rolling Stone Book of the Beach just came out. Carolyn and I are both in that. Uh, Johnny Depp. Huh? Johnny Depp. <laughs> Johnny Depp's in there too, but so are we. <laughs> yeah, what is and he? I know, a bunch of I, other cool people. I was just thinking about his performance and your performance. Uh-huh. Difference. <laughs> Never mind. And you're going to write a book any day now. You yeah, yeah, any day now. I'm, I'm cranking up for that. I've got a little time on my hands right now. I've got the luxury to sit down at the computer. You know, in her day, those 1143 pages were all on the old typewriter. No spell check. No, uh, you oh, know, Oh, yeah, and all different computer. kinds of paper. It's, I it's just amazing. can't believe it. I mean, nowadays we're so spoiled. Yeah, we yes, are. Yes, except <laughs> my printer broke, and so that hangs up a bit. Yeah, yeah that electric <laughs> stuff really can get you. She's on a computer yeah. now, of course. Her yeah. printer's broken. Story of her life. Uh, yeah, well, you see, there's not all that wonderful art. Well, Carolyn, thank you very much for coming by the studio today and talking with us. Oh, and John, thank you. Thank you. Of course. Uh, Unexpected pleasure. Brian. Brian. <laughs> uh, I'm bad here. We just called yeah, him a half hour ago. <laughs> and uh, we really appreciate uh, you coming by. You bet. You did and, uh, wonderfully. Thank you. Uh, let's hear it for David, I think it is. It's David. Hey, yeah. Yeah. You got one First for time. one. Yeah. <laughs> so, oh, there we go. Okay. Uh, check the books out. Yeah. Check the performances out whenever you get a chance. Wonderful people. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, David. Cheers. <laughs>